Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're returning to the topic of the Psalms and their meaning. Now, a brief disclaimer before getting into this psalm. The Psalms will be numbered differently in different translations of the Bible. This is a very, very old discrepancy, and to help clear things up, I'll be explaining what number the psalm has in the Dewey Reims Bible and in the Revised Standard Version. However, the episodes themselves will list psalm numbers as they're given in the Dewey Reims Bible. Sorry if this is confusing. Anyway, this is Psalm 44 in the Dewey Reims Bible, but Psalm 45 in the RSV. On to the end. For them that shall be changed, for the sons of Kor, for understanding. A canticle for the beloved. Again, we see the sons of Kor, Korah, mentioned here, as in the last psalm. And as in the last one, it's specifically described as being for understanding. My heart hath uttered a good word. I speak my words to the king. My tongue is the pen of a scrivener that writeth swiftly. A scrivener is a scribe, someone whose job it would have been to make copies of important books and documents prior to the invention of the printing press, This psalm seems not to have been written by David or any other king. It's written from the perspective of someone who speaks to the king quickly, possibly an advisor, priest, or prophet. Thou art beautiful above the sons of men. Grace is poured abroad in thy lips. Therefore hath God blessed thee forever. It's not entirely clear who this is directed towards, but since the following verses make reference to might and a reign, and since this verse makes it clear that this isn't directed at God himself, we can suppose that this is about the king. This makes sense since the previous verse mentioned how the psalmist spoke words to the king. This portion seems to be some of those words. The king is complimented for his beauty and that he speaks with grace and mercy, which is why God blesses him. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O thou most mighty. With thy comeliness and thy beauty set out, proceed prosperously and reign because of truth and meekness and justice, and thy right hand shall conduct thee wonderfully. Right hand, in this case, means sword hand. Most people are and were right-handed, and you generally don't use a sword with your worse hand. The king is advised to go out armed in these verses, but also to conduct himself with humility, justice, and truthfulness in order to attain good results. In short, show people that you have strength, but be fair and good with that strength. Thy arrows are sharp, Under thee shall people fall, into the hearts of the king's enemies. The sentence structure is odd here, but this doesn't mean that the king will cause people to fall into his enemies' hearts. It means that his arrows will fly into their hearts, killing them, and many will fall under him. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. Now we're not talking to the king anymore. This portion of the psalm is directed at God again, and it cites two of the attributes of God, that he's eternal and all good. Thou hast loved justice and hated iniquity. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Myrrh and sect and cassia perfume thy garments from the ivory houses, out of which the daughters of kings have delighted thee in thy glory. The queen stood on thy right hand in gilded clothing, surrounded with variety. This psalm zips around to a lot of different people. For a moment we were talking to God, and now it's back to the king again. The king has made the sacrifices needed to do what's right, so he was given greater happiness than those around him. His mother, remember in Israel the queen was the king's mother, not his wife, is standing beside him to offer advice, and great riches surround them both. Hearken, O daughter, and see, and incline thy ear, and forget thy people and thy father's house. The psalmist is now speaking to someone else, possibly his own daughter, and possibly the daughter of someone else. He's telling her that there are things she should be thinking about apart from just her life with her family and her people. And the king shall greatly desire thy beauty, for he is the Lord thy God, and him they shall adore. Still directed at the daughter, here, however, the word king doesn't refer to the human king from most of the psalm, but to God himself, who desires people to have beautiful souls and to use their will in good and beautiful ways by avoiding sin and doing good for others, the truest form of beauty there is apart from his own. This is definitely something that deserves our attention more than our lives and worldly affairs. And the daughters of Tyre with gifts, yea, all the rich among the people shall entreat thy countenance. You'll be greatly rewarded for placing the will of God over your earthly concerns. Tyre was an ancient port city in the land of Phoenicia. Both the city and the land were known for successful trade, and port cities in general tended to have a lot of wealth. Tyre is therefore a reference to the richest places and people of all time. 
All the glory of the king's daughter is within in golden borders, clothed round about with varieties. After her shall virgins be brought to the king, her neighbors shall be brought to thee. Great riches surround the king and his daughter, and lots of women will want to marry him. They shall be brought with gladness and rejoicing. They shall be brought into the temple of the king. Women will be happy to worship with the king, or, if this verse is using the term king to refer to God, to worship God in a temple devoted to him. This verse, sadly, is unclear about which of these two is meant. Instead of thy fathers, sons are born to thee. Thou shalt make them princes over all the earth. At the time, no one would have referred to God as having fathers, so this is probably referring to the king again, implying that he'll be successful enough in his life to give his sons powerful positions all over the world. They shall remember thy name throughout all generations. Therefore shall people praise thee forever, yea, forever and ever. This verse could be directed at God, the king, or both. A good king who reaches heaven would definitely be honored forever there, but so will God. So in the end, this psalm offers guidance and honor to a good ruler and to God, advising others to consider their higher obligations first before worldly things, although, sadly, it's a bit difficult to follow because it frequently addresses different people without any clear indication that it's switching to someone else. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.